Made in Britain is a 1982 release teleplay directed by Alan Clark. Yes, it uh, stars Tim Roth as Trevor, who is a 16-year-old skinhead. When we meet him, he's been arrested, and then he's sent to an assessment centre, uh, which they well, where they sort of assess whether he needs to be banged up or uh, something else to happen to him. I don't, I don't think we have them anymore, do we? But but um, no, you know, there's other there's <clears throat> other sort of kids there as well who are sort of waiting for court dates and things like that. Uh, and that's kind of what he's waiting for as well, because he's you know, basically he's, he's accused of um, what stealing cars, and he also threw a threw a brick through someone's window. So yeah, we meet his his social worker, who is played by Eric Richard, who uh, well, lots of British stuff, but probably Sergeant, most famous as Sergeant Cry in the Bill. Yeah, that's it. I'm known from that. And uh, <laughs> yes, so there's you know, and then this once he leaves them at this assessment centre, there's various other. I don't know what we would call them. Uh, not what it's not a prison or a ball store, so it's not wardens. Um, I don't know it's the staff, shall we say, <laughs> who will assess him and make sure that he, uh, uh, you know, behaves himself, um, which he doesn't. Well, he gets sent to the job centre and makes a nuisance of himself in there, and then chucks a brick through a window of that. <laughs> so goes and sniffs some glue and <laughs> steals another car. Yeah, he's, you know. We, we talked about scum uh, in another video and um, there's a character in that who's, who's quite, you know, he's obviously that's in a ball store, but this guy's quite intelligent and articulate. And Trevor is almost a bit like that. You know, you can tell that <clears throat> he's not an idiot. Uh, and while he does have a swastika tattooed on his forehead, you get the sense that he's only done that uh, and only sort of pretends to be, ra- not pretends to be racist, but kind of... I mean, I think the, the interesting thing with this film is, um, you know, it obviously is the time it's made in. Mm. You know, I mean, in a way, it actually feels quite relevant to today. But you get the sense that, I mean, he's racist. There is racism from him. Mm. But I kind of feel it's almost like an immature racism. Like, he doesn't really quite understand where he's getting his racism. Or he's getting his racism, racism from those that are around him. Yeah. You know, or, his, maybe his family or his parents or people like that. It's because just because it's it, what well, he wants to be, it, because it's not acceptable. It, and it's know, that too. He wants yeah, to do the opposite of what, you know, the everything. rules say he should be he's, doing. Yeah, yeah, he's going against everything that the, that the system is, is trying to, mm. you know, the system is trying to put him right and he's going against everything that they're trying to help, trying to do for him. In which case, and that suggests maybe he is way more intelligent than, than, mm. than, than he wants everyone to think he is. Um, and you know there is a, a strange, he's, you know, so he so he throws this brick through a, a, a an Asian man's window, but then of course later when he goes to the the assessment centre, he kind of he doesn't make friends with, but he kind of buddies up with this. Well, yeah, black he, man. he's put in a room, so, with, yeah, with a black kid, and you think, oh god, you know, because yeah. for the first time we see them meeting, he's like, I want that bed. So you think, oh god, he's going to beat be, beat him up and take his bed, yeah, yeah. but then actually he he doesn't, and then they kind of, yeah, he. He hangs out with him, and they, you know, they sniff glue together. And well, he doesn't do him they just do this kid any favors in the end. But it's not really. I don't think that's done out of racism. I don't think because if he was really like that, he wouldn't want to be. No, you know, you, he, wouldn't, you, he would you, just beat him. You up. get the feeling if that if that guy was white, he would have done exactly the same yeah, thing yeah, as well. Exactly, he just yeah. didn't. He just doesn't care about the system, and he's very argumentative, and he just wants to kind of knock down everyone that gets in his way. Mm. So yeah, I mean yeah, you mentioned Scum. We did Scum. So we did the Blu-ray, the new Blu-ray release of Scum last night mm. uh, by Indicator, and we didn't really talk in depth about Alan Clark in that. So obviously this is another Alan Clark film. Um, this is this is an interesting one. This was actually so the very beginning of this film pops up Tales Out of School, uh, the title, and so this is one of four teleplays yeah. uh, that were written by David Leland himself, also a filmmaker. I saw this one just. You know, long years ago, I, kind I think of, of the four, it is the most famous, <clears throat> isn't it? It's the most famous. It's the most kind of the, the most kind of visceral and in your face mm. uh, film, and it's probably the most controversial out of the three of them too. Um, I mean, Alan Clark. They're, so they're all directed by different filmmakers, yeah. but yeah, Alan Clark was known for for making very kind of hard hitting, almost documentary yeah, feeling, sort of social commentary, social commentary. Yeah, and uh, although I I really like Scum, if you can like such a film. <laughs> I always preferred this one. Mm. It, it follows that kind of sense of isolation, you know, similar, kind of similar to what we were talking about in you know, my private Idaho last week. You have this, you know, something that cinema, it's that character that a tr- cinema attracts is that mm. kind of lost individual <clears throat> searching for something feels very out of place in society. Yeah. Um, and it's clear that you know society has almost created this person, yeah. and uh, and and now doesn't know what to do with him. That yeah, I mean, there's a lot of talk of following rules and obeying authority and things like that. And 
you almost sympathise with him for having that pushed on him because sometimes you know the world feels like that where you 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 know you've got all these constraints and you've got all these rules that you have to follow and you mustn't do this and you mustn't say that and things like that and while obviously a lot of things you shouldn't say or do um sometimes it you know it can feel oppressive and i think that's what he feels that society is oppressing him and pushing him down and he can't just be who he wants to be he doesn't necessarily want to be the person that he is but he doesn't want to be who everyone else wants him to be so it's his way of rebelling against that system and and he you know to try and break out of it he has to be sort of a more extreme version of himself to just say look i don't want to be part of your society because it doesn't mean anything to me i don't want to play by your rules because yeah, your yeah. rules you know suppress who i want to be so you kind of you know have sympathy for him for yeah that, that i mean that's that i think that's why it's quite a tough watch actually mm. because you know obviously the whole time you're watching this character with with a swastika tattooed yeah. into the front of his skull <laughs> and yet there are moments where you you do feel sorry for him or you feel sorry for the the world i mean he's living in the thatcher world mm. you know everything's very kind of you know a lot of people are, are you know down on the bottom there's yeah. a, you know lots of there's no money anyway everyone's on the <laughs> dole and and it was you know it was not the, the the although you know i obviously was lucky to grow up in quite a nice environment during the 80s many people and right. like today still you know they're not they don't they don't grow up in mm. in, in pleasant societies and they get pushed down, and they get forgotten about, and it's clear that he is very intelligent, but he's also got this rebellious streak, and mm. he doesn't want to. He doesn't want to follow anyone's rules, and he's lost. Grown ups just don't understand kids, do they? They just even don't though, understand. Even though you've kids. been a kid, yeah. you don't understand. You just there's that point where they kind of flip over. Yeah. Always, I remember there was, a, there was a line in the Breakfast Club, and they always talk about, you know, <coughs> my God, are we going to become our parents? Yeah. And they're like, yes, you, yes, you it's will. just inevitable. It just happens. <laughs> and you completely forget what it's like to be a kid. Exactly. And, and why you uh, don't want to obey all these rules. Yeah, yeah. And I think, but I think, you know, I think, I think this film is, is a very important film. It was obviously, I mean, it's clearly controversial, I suppose. I found a really interesting interview with Tim Roth, and obviously, mm. this is Tim Roth, and it's his first. It's his first film that he ever did. He came along from... I think, so similarly with him, and I think him and Gary Oldman had both been young actors at... There's a theatre in London called The Oval, which is opposite the Oval Cricket Ground. And this is quite a famous... It's still there today, and it, it turned out... It turns out a lot of young actors, mm-hmm. and a lot of... Um, I think a lot of the actors that came out and then went on to work with people like Alan Clark and Ken Loach and Mike Lee, you know, these kind of working-class um, films, Paul Chales, in the 80s, uh, came from you know these kind of kind of independent theatres um, and a lot of gritty performers and people like that. Uh, the story goes that he popped into the Oval because he got a flat tyre on his mm-hmm. car, and they were like, um, they told him, "Oh, there's these auditions going ahead for this film. You should you should go up for it. You know, you need to shave your head." And of course, he went up for it and he got it, and uh, and he was you know obviously very happy he got it because well. Oh, look where look look where Tim Roth has gone mm. since then. But that's sort of, there's an interview with him on on YouTube talking about this and. And he says that apparently around the time, a lot of people were like saying, you know, um, you can't make a film about a racist. And he's like, well, why not? You know, if you don't make a film about these people, does that mean they don't exist? No, exactly. You know, you're just going to just kind of <clears throat> push it down and think it's, you know, think it'll all go away. Yeah. Well, it won't. You need to make films about people. So you can understand why they are the way they are. Exactly. Yeah. And I think this film is, 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 is really good in that sense. I mm. think it, it really does show, you know, who, who these people are. And then the world you're living in, you know, back in the 80s, it wasn't all roses and, and and things like that and uh, you know the, the country was suffering and mm. uh, and you know you need people you need filmmakers like Alan Clark and Ken Loach and Mike Lee to to, to show you those worlds whether yeah. you agree with it or not you know they they, they, they are out there no I think this is a, a, an excellent film I've seen this quite a few times I love how it's shot as well so Alan Clark kind of discovered the steady cam from I think it was Stephen Frears who introduced him to the steady cam and so he went that kind of went on to become a staple thing in a lot of his films and uh, there's some just wonderful steady cam shots just following Tim Roth a lot of it is yeah just following him around following him around which makes it feel very claustrophobic Mm -hmm. I mean Mm -hmm. Tim Roth is a superb actor I mean that was in you know Alan Clark so he used Ray Winstone in Scum he used Tim Roth in this one and then he went on to use Gary Oldman in the firm although Gary Oldman had already kind of made a name for himself you know he was he, he knew good actors and he was able to let them be great actors. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, one thing they did a lot more in those days than they do now is they were able to rehearse mm. a lot more. <clears throat> so they were able to go around and, and kind of block their scenes and, and rehearse and rehearse and rehearse and really become these characters. Mm. And uh, it feels very claustrophobic at times, this film. You never, you're kind of always with Tim, you're always with Trevor. Yeah. And you get, you smile with him, 
you, you kind of wince at him and you fear mm. him and you worry about you him. You worry what he's going to do next. You worry what he's going to do next, exactly. And there's, a one, there's an amazing scene actually kind of halfway through when he's at the assessment centre yeah. and they come in and they basically go through you know, where he's come from and where he's going to go. Yeah. And they really kind of you know, drill into him that if he doesn't buck his ideas up, he's going to go to prison. And then yeah. when he goes to prison, he's kind of stuck in this eternal loop mm. going round and round. I mean, he comes out of prison, he'll try and get a job, he won't get a job. He'll go on the dole, he'll turn back to thieving and he'll be back in the mm. prison system. Mm. And that's kind of what the film is just saying. That, you know, if you don't sort yourself out, you're going to be stuck in the system yeah, yeah. forever. We've got you and, and, and there's no escape. And, I that. mean, you know, while, while you're sort of rooted, well, you, you kind of, you, that scene shows it for both sides. I mean, he, even uh, Trevor, during that scene, he's very quiet and you could almost yeah. see stuff starting to sink in. You that, totally can, You know, this yeah. is, yeah, I'm... I'm screwed if I carry on being the way I am, and yeah. and you know the guy uh, is it the superintendent I think isn't it, and he's got yeah. a chalk, you know a, a blackboard and a piece of chalk, and he writes it all down. And you can tell that I mean I, I, it's an amazing scene that he just he remembers all this stuff. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of dialogue, a lot of dialogue, yeah. and um, you know you can from you know from a character point of view you can see that he's given this speech so many times that he knows it off by heart because he's seen so many kids so many go kids through the go. same route over and over again, and he's yeah. really. You know, and they uh, they do. You know, it's not like scum where they just have complete contempt for these kids. They do care. And they don't. They don't want to see them go into the system because they know what happens. They want to try and, you know, get it get through to them and say, look, you know, we're trying to help you. Even if you don't want our help, we're trying to help you and change the path that you're on. And this yeah, is yeah. because if you don't, this is what's going to happen. Exactly. And um, I, mean, I mean, yeah, because going on from that, they kind of those guys kind of give up on him. But then there's this one guy who who, who kind of want believes that he can help him and then after that he sets up this kind of a, he takes a couple of them out to do um banger racing yeah and uh, and there's, there's there's moments in there where you you feel like tim uh, trevor's got character's got through and he's yeah. having fun and he's enjoying something different and then but then it, it also shows that if anything goes wrong he loses his temper mm-hmm. very quickly mm-hmm. and then pff, it just all falls I mean, apart i think there's him. almost sort of a resistance with himself thinking oh I'm, you know i'm sliding into to fitting into this society and that's not what i want to do you know i don't want to why am I allowing myself to fit in? So you know he's all, he's conflicted within himself. To yeah, a totally. Point as well. Totally. Uh, I mean, it's almost like a you know we talked about scum. It's almost like a prequel to that yeah. because obviously scum shows you know the inside of the ball store. It doesn't basically it doesn't show anything else. It's only, it's all set within that ball store. You know they say that that's that's where you could end up to Trevor, and um, so you know and it could almost it could almost lead straight into to scum. Even though obviously that character isn't in there, there's plenty of 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 kids in there that, that you know probably aren't that dissimilar from Trevor. Alan Clark was a groundbreaking filmmaker. Mm. These were groundbreaking films at their time. Um, I, you know, I just I think this is it's well worth seeing, and you you obviously still can. I have it on. We have the same DVD. Yep, but just DVD. <laughs> I have this one from uh, Carlton. That was, uh, that was something to do with ITV. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think something. it was originally broadcast on ITV, wasn't it? Oh, was so, it? Yeah. <clears throat> right. Okay. And uh, this is showing. You probably can't see it, but I'll stick a clip over. It's that a moment that he walks down the kind of through this tunnel on a road and and kind of gets to. Uh, <laughs> it's very cross. I mean, it, actually, there was a great scene um, that that reminded me of Fight Club, actually, where he's walking past like a department store and he oh, sees yeah, like yeah. a setup of you know there's yeah, mannequins yeah, that, sure. with with clothes on and there's a TV and a sofa and all these price tags on everything. It, yeah, it, it took me back to 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 Fight Club where you know like Tyler Durden is sort of. Almost a similar kind of character where he's just completely against society, you know, the, the the rules and regulations that society impose on him, <clears> and um, yeah, it's no, not completely dissimilar to that. The camera's behind Tim Roth, yeah, and he's just looking around this this kind of shop window of it's quite like a nice setup of mm. you know man, father, mother, children, TV, and he's looking at it, you're not sure what, what's going on. No. Is, is he wishing no, yeah, he like that, or does he just not care? Because then he just walks away from it. I was just waiting for him to get a brick. Well, I was <laughs> waiting for that as well, but he doesn't. He walks no. away from it. It's, mm. it's, it's, it's powerful stuff in this film, and that's leading up to quite a powerful moment uh, yeah. at the end of the film. That kind of shows you, you know, you do what you're told, yeah. whether you like it or not. Mm. So this is just, this is an old one. Is there a Blu-ray? There is a Blu-ray. There's a, a set with the, the four the films. The Tales Out Score yeah. is on a, on a Blu-ray yeah. set. That's great. Yeah, so it's the four films by yeah by David Ian. You can't, I don't think it's available separately, but I think you can pick up that set quite cheap. So um, so yeah, that that's how you can get it on Blu-ray. But again, DVD is not, not hard to find. Not hard to find. No, I did actually also want to mention, I forgot to mention him when I was talking about the Steadicam, Chris Menges. 
I think that's how you pronounce his surname. He was the camera operator on this film, so he would have obviously done a lot of the steady cam shots. And he has had a fascinating career. I went away and I, I kind of read, a, I found an interview with him, and he kind of started working on like documentaries in the 60s and 70s. He was in Vietnam, he went to Burma, he went to some pretty crazy places, um, chased out of countries, and then he kind of came home and he started, I think he worked for Stephen Frears, he worked on, he was second unit on Empire Strikes Back. Oh. So a really interesting Man, and like I said, I think this film is really interestingly shot um, yeah. in that way. And then Adam Clark kind of went on to, to use it. If you watch Elephant, there's a lot of kind of, you know, these static shots of, of, of people just going along, uh, just killing people, because yeah. that's, that's based on the Northern Ireland troubles. So, yeah, I think, you know, interesting, uh, really interesting film. And, uh, you know, if you don't know it, I, I recommend uh, you go and check it out. I just think it, you know, it has something interesting to say and obviously an amazing central performance. Incredible, uh, incredible Tim central Roth. performance mm. from Tim Roth. Yeah, I think he's probably, out of those three we mentioned, I think Tim Roth's probably the best. But Ray Winstone's great and scum. Mm. And Gary Oldman, well, the film's very short, isn't it? It's like, it's like, it's like it's just under 70 minutes, I think. Yeah. Right, OK. Yeah. That's a great film as well, also. Mm. Maybe one to cover as well sometime. So that was Made in Britain. And as always, if you enjoyed the video, let us know in the comments below. Hit the subscribe button up there if you've enjoyed what you've watched and don't forget to hit the bell for notifications. There's some other videos to check out over there and come and find us on Twitter and Facebook and come back next week for another one.